Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello, I'm Christine Beck. I am the current Poet Laureate of the town of West Hartford. Welcome to Poetry Around the Town. If you're not familiar with this television program, it is a monthly program in which I discuss poetry events and or poetry for you, the citizens of our town. You can see prior uh, episodes of this program if you want to go on the West Hartford Community TV website, and you can click on Poetry Around the Town under Video on Demand and see prior programs. This particular program is going to be about the poetry of Ireland and Irish poets in honor of the month of March in which, as we all know, St. Patrick's Day occurs. So I'm really honored to bring this to you uh, today and to think with you about some of the famous poets and poetry of Ireland. I heard Billy Collins recently talk about Irish poetry. Billy Collins is perhaps the best known current American uh, poet. He um, he actually makes money selling books of poetry, which is quite extraordinary. And if you haven't heard Billy Collins, he will be performing this summer at the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival on the grounds of the Hillstead Museum in Farmington, Connecticut. I highly recommend that you come out to the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival if you haven't done so before. You can go on the website of either hillstead.org or sunkengardenpoetry.org and review the schedule of events for this coming summer. But Billy Collins, I believe, is going to be the first uh, poet who will be reading as part of the series, and uh, he's definitely someone not to be missed. In any event, uh, Billy Collins was talking about Irish poetry, and he said one of the reasons he believes that Irish poetry is so famous is because, as he put it, poetry is a portable art. He said, Ireland has no famous architecture, uh, no famous opera, uh, no famous works of painting, but it has words. And he believed that that was one of the reasons why we have such resonant um, poetry uh, coming out of Ireland. You can agree or disagree with that. I thought it was a, an interesting perspective on, on uh, Irish poetry. In any event, it's difficult to read and discuss Irish poetry without knowing a little bit about Irish history. So although this is not a history lesson, um, bear with me for a, a few moments while I give a little bit of background about Irish history and also some of the poets we'll be talking about today. Um, so there was a very famous potato famine in Ireland. It began in the year uh, 1845 and over a million people died um, as a result of the potato famine. So this is something that the knowledge of this has informed certainly all of the poets writing thereafter. Um, and you'll see that specifically in a couple of the poems that I will read today. Um, also in 1880 was a, uh, a, a well-known revolt that took place uh, by the Irish against British rule it was led by someone named Parnell. It was ultimately crushed, but you will hear Parnell referred to in uh, one of the poems that I'm going to read today. I'm going to begin by reading a little bit of what I call poetry that is actually not written by someone who's known for his poetry, and that is James Joyce. But I believe that James Joyce and his use of language has permeated the culture of um, Irish writers writing thereafter. Um, I'm also going to read William Butler Yeats, who, of course, is probably the most famous um, Irish poet. 
and he was more or less a contemporary of James Joyce. That is to say, James Joyce published his famous book, Ulysses, in 1922. William Butler Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. So although I, uh, I don't take the position that Yeats was in particular um, influenced by James Joyce, I believe that many of the poets thereafter were. I'll also be reading some poems by Seamus Heaney, who uh, was a contemporary in, uh, Irish poet, born, born and lived in Ireland. Um, he died in 2013, so he died relatively recently. And finally, I'm going to read some poetry by Ivan Boland, uh, a woman. Her na first name is spelled E-V-A-N, and it's pronounced Ivan. Um, and uh, it's particularly important to me that I introduce you to a female Irish poet. I'll be talking a little bit more about her and her significance to the poetry of Ireland um, as we get to her work. So let's get started. I want to read first a very short excerpt from Ulysses. It's from the chapter called The Sirens. The novel Ulysses uh, was meant to resonate with the, uh, the Greek poem about Ulysses and his attempts to get back home after the Trojan War. So uh, the sirens, of course, were uh, living on an island, and they were singing their siren song. They were attempting to uh, waylay the sailors who were on their ship. And so in this particular scene, uh, it takes place in a bar in Dublin, and the uh, siren, I suppose, is the barmaid. And there is another character whose name is Boylan, and Boylan is kind of the arch nemesis of the narrator uh, of uh, Ulysses. He's um, pompous, um, very well dressed, and what I want you to listen for is particularly the use of language in this very small excerpt. So it's from Ulysses by James Joyce in his chapter called Sirens. Boylan eyed, eyed, tossed to fat lips his chalice, drank off his chalice tiny, sucking the last fat violet syrupy drops. His spellbound eyes went after, after her gliding head as it went down the bar by mirrors, gilded arch for ginger ale, hock and claret glasses shimmering, a spiky shell where it concerted mirrored bronze with sunnier bronze. By bachelor's walk jog jaunty jingled blazes boiland bachelor in sun in heat mare's glossy rump a trot with flick of whip on bounding tires sprawled warm seated boilin impatience ardent bold horn have you the horn have you the ha ha horn so one of the reasons I love this is because uh, James Joyce makes up words and he makes up words that have a sound that appeals to him and to us and gives us a feeling for action. So when we hear, by bachelor's walk, jog jaunty, jingled, blazes, boilin, we get a certain sense of this character, blazes, boilin, and his jog jaunty jingle, which I think is, um, is terrific. And um, he's called ardent bold, ardent bold, one word. Now again, uh, James Joyce is making up words. And uh, other poets certainly have been known for uh, this characteristic of using words that are not really words. Um, but it, I think it gives us a sense of part of this portfolio, if you will, of Irish language. Now I am going to turn to Yeats, as I mentioned that I would, William Butler Yeats. Um, he was a Protestant. Uh, he was born in 1865, died in 1939. And he uh, was known for a number of things. One is he felt very strongly in anchoring his poetry in the history of Ireland. This is after some initial poems that dealt with other places. He finally just came to believe, in part because of his association with uh, other characters that he met who were very passionate about Ireland and the history of Ireland. 
so he wrote a lot, of, he wrote actually many poems about some Irish myths. Um, he also became interested in the occult later in life, not unlike our own Connecticut poet James Merrill and his Ouija boards. And he um, was unlucky, I guess you would say, in love. He fell in love with a woman named Maud Gunn. He first proposed to her in 1921. He had an on and off again love affair with her for probably over 30 years. And many of his poems were written about that unrequited love. But she also had a passion for Irish history and for um, the role of Ireland. And I think that affected a lot of what he, he wrote. So the first poem you probably will be familiar with it's called The Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. And there midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. So not only is this a beautiful poem about a place, the Lake Isle of Innisfree, and he evokes it, I think, beautifully, but it's also about the last line, I hear it in the deep heart's core. So in the last two lines of this poem, we have the writer saying, while I stand on the roadway, obviously not at the Lake Isle of Industry, or on pavements gray, I hear it, the sounds of the Lake Isle of Industry in the deep heart's core. So it's a, it's a poem of longing, and I think it can be read as a poem of longing for more than just one particular place. It's really a longing for uh, the rural part of Ireland and its grace and its beauty as connecting in with the heart of the poet. Very beautiful poem. And now I'm going to read When You Are Old, which was actually published in 1892. This was a year after uh, Yeats first uh, proposed to Maud Gunn and was refused. Um, we don't know if it was written specifically about her, but clearly at the time, she was a young woman. And this poem is, uh, positing or wondering about uh, someone who is much older. So when you are old. When you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Very beautiful poem about love abiding, uh, about love changing uh, and yet not changing, about the beloved becoming old and about the one who loves, loving the pilgrim soul. I think that's really a telling phrase in this poem, um, the pilgrim, the, the searcher, the searcher after truth, after uh, perhaps grace, the one searching for something. And I think that's a lovely image for what remains in the love of the writer for the beloved. And then, of course, the character of love itself. 
being personified as a he, interesting, and he paces on the mountains and then hides his face amid a crowd of stars. So the idea of love being all-encompassing, being part of the heavens, is I think also very, very beautiful. Um, Yeats has been referred to as someone who has written ex exquisitely beautiful poetry, and I hope these are two examples of that. I want to turn now to um, Seamus Heaney. I had the great good fortune to hear Seamus Heaney in person, um, I think about a year before he died. And um, he had a wonderful Irish lilt. I, of course, cannot do justice to these poems. I'm not even trying to do justice to them in terms of the sound of uh, the Irish lilt, but Seamus Heaney definitely had that. I'm going to read one of his most famous poems, which is called Digging. And I would add as an aside that I just finished judging a competition called Poetry Out Loud, in which uh, students between the uh, grades of 9 and 12 memorize and recite a poem. It is a competition throughout the state of Connecticut. The winner then goes on to compete at the national level in Washington, DC. Owen Elphick uh, won the state competition two years ago, and one of the poems he read was this poem by Seamus Heaney. I think he chose very well. So it's called Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound. When the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Turner's bog. Once, I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. So I hope you can hear in this poem some of that resonance of James Joyce, some of that wonderful language about um, uh, the, the nicking and slicing, neatly heaving sods. Again, that beautiful, beautiful repetition of sound in his poem. But also the very interesting juxtaposition between the pen, the spade, and the gun. Now, normally, a poet likes to surprise us at the end of a poem with what we call a turn in the poetry. So um, we would expect, perhaps, to see that gun show up at the end. And yet, Seamus Heaney brings it up at the very beginning. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests snug as a gun. Now, he never returns to the gun. We never hear anything more about the gun. It reminds me of a famous saying about um, drama. I've forgotten who said it, but it was, if you put a gun on the table in act one, it better go off by act three. 
In other words, you've created an expectation. Your audience expects if there's a gun there, something's going to happen with the gun. So the question is, what happens with Seamus Heaney's gun? What happens? I don't know the answer. You can probably look on the internet. There are probably a million different theories about this. I'll give you mine. So much of the history of Ireland involves guns. So much of the writing about the history in Ireland involves guns. And I believe that this gun is planted here to remind us that even people who are digging for potatoes or digging for turf are in some way imbued with the history of violence that is part of the history of Ireland. So go check that out. Decide what you think. You can communicate with me on my, on my website, which is christinebeck.net. Uh, send, me, uh, send me what you think about Seamus Heaney and the pen snug as a gun. I now want to turn to Ivan Boland, as I said I would. Ivan Boland is also a contemporary uh, poet, um, born uh, not too long after uh, Seamus Heaney. He was born in 1939. She was born in 1944. Ivan Boland is currently um, in her poetry appearances reading one poem that obviously is very important to her. She published it in 2008. And I'm going to begin with that poem and then go back to um, one of her earlier ones. It's called Quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season, of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking. They were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north until at nightfall under freezing stars they arrived. In the morning they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847. Also, what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and woman and in which darkness it can best be proved. So that's called Quarantine by Ivan Boland. Obviously, it is about the potato famine. Uh, she talks about their death together in the winter of 1847 when the potato famine was raging. It's a beautiful poem. And um, Ivan Boland has taken the position that um, she wants to reclaim the role of women in Irish poetry. That is very important to her. And so um, she, she points out that um, there was a time when uh, women were not supposed to be poets in Ireland. They were supposed to be the object of poetry in Ireland. Um, and uh, she takes the position that women need to take their place not only as poets, but as poets of the role of women in Ireland. So I'm just going to read uh, a little bit of uh, Irish interior as a, a final uh, poem here, uh, also by Ivan Boland. The woman sits and spins. She makes no sound. The man behind her stands by the door. There is always this, a background, a foreground. This much we know. They do not want to be here. The year is 1890. The inks have long since dried. The name of the drawing is an Irish interior. The year is 1890. 
Before the inks are dry, Parnell will fall and orchards burn, where the two captains, Moonlight, Boycott, have had their way. She has a spinning wheel. He has a loom. She has a shawl. He stands beside a landscape, maybe a river, maybe hills, maybe even a farm, opening into a distance of water song and a wood they cannot reach. Nothing belongs to them but this melody and tyranny and hopelessness of thread rendered by line work and the skewed perspective the eye attains between his hand and the way her hand rests on the wheel, which goes to prove only this, that there is always near and far as she works in one, he weaves inside the other. Which we are in has yet to be made clear as we stare through the lines until their lives have almost disappeared and all we see, all we want to see, are places in the picture light forgives, such as the grain of the wood, the close seal of the thread at the top of the loom, and a door opening into an afternoon they can never avail of. So this, of course, is a reference to 1890, right before uh, an uprising led by Purnell. And it's a beautiful description of a painting, but also of people trapped in a painting. And I think there is that trapped feeling um, in so much of what Ivan Bolin so beautifully evokes. Um, a small domestic scene, an Irish interior, yet standing for so much more than just the small room in, in Ireland in 1890. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, program on Irish poets. I hope you will bring a favorite poem to our event at the West Hartford Public Library, where we will be bringing um, favorite poems and talking about them. It is on Monday, May 3, and you're invited to, um, to RSVP for that event. Um, I hope to see you there sharing a favorite poem of yours, perhaps, who knows, even an Irish uh, poem. So thank you very much for joining me. Next month we'll be doing poems about flowers because it will be April and um, I will be enjoying sharing with you some famous poems about flowers. Thank you. <laughs>